Thank you. It's um, great to be here. We rely on photographs to document our personal and our collective histories. We don't seem to have to work at interpreting photographs. Photographs instantaneously and effortlessly convey meaning and emotion. I'm going to argue, however, that what I just said is completely wrong. <laughs> and that, in fact, we can be spectacularly bad at interpreting photographs. And that the failure to do so can have serious and long-lasting consequences. So, most of you will recognize this as the former, don't turn your hats, as the former Alaskan governor, Sarah Palin. And if I flip that photo around, you've got to ask yourself, what is wrong with Sarah Palin? <laughs> now here's the interesting part. It actually looks just about right. So what is wrong with your visual system that it is confused about something so grossly wrong? And you can interpret that in any way you choose. Here's a simple line drawing of two tables. And I think most people will agree that the shape of the tables are, in fact, quite different. So let's find out. Here's a little red box that um, outlines the table on the left. I'm going to rotate that and slide it over. And in fact, they're exactly the same. And now I ask you again, what's the shape of those two tables? And you can't help but see them as different. So, what exactly is wrong with your brain? Here's another nice example, uh, credited to Ted Adelson. Uh, checkerboard with a cylinder on it. There is a square labeled A and a square labeled B. And I ask you to judge which one is darker and which one is lighter. And most of you will agree that the check labeled A is quite darker than the check labeled B. But when I overlay this mask and only show you those two squares in isolation, they're in fact exactly the same. And now when I take it away, and I ask you again, you can't help yourself, even though I've told you the right answer. So again, what is wrong with our ability to, to reason about and analyze such simple things in a photograph as the orientation of the mouth and the eye, the simple shape that a ruler can solve and something as simple as which one is darker and which one is brighter. Now, you may be thinking that these are mere parlor tricks, that uh, there's a small number of photographs that I can play tricks with. But I'm going to argue that, in fact, this is not the exception, that this happens quite often, and that the consequences can be very serious when we fail to know how to reason about and decipher photographs. This is a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald which most people agree assassinated John F. Kennedy in 1963. And it shows Oswald in his backyard holding a rifle, a sidearm, and communist newspapers. This photograph was used by the Warren Commission as a piece of damaging evidence against Oswald because the rifle that he's holding in his hand is the same rifle that was used to kill Kennedy. In fact, this was such an incriminating photograph that Oswald himself in 1963, he said, the photo's a fake. I don't know where you got that from. Now, over the last 50 years, there's been a lot of discussion about who was responsible and what parties were responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And there are many people out, out there, 80% of American people, by the way, who believe that there was a broader conspiracy responsible for Kennedy's assassination. And one of the linchpin pieces of evidence that people have used is purported inconsistencies in this photograph as evidence of a broader conspiracy. For example, people have argued that the lighting and the shadows in this photograph are inconsistent and physically impossible with the scene. And what I mean by the scene is that he's outdoors and the sun is illuminating him. So let's just take a minute to think a little bit about the lighting and the shadows in this photograph. So here he is standing, he's outdoors, we have the sun, 
and I'm going to position myself r- roughly where he is, and look at the shadow on the ground, and you see it is being cast back and to the right. So if I ask you to guess where is the sun relative to him, you would guess something like this, up and to the left. And you'd probably guess that it's relatively low because that shadow is, in fact, quite long. Okay? So that seems like a reasonable first-order approximation. So let's look at his face. That's a magnified view of his face. And now just focus on the shadow that his nose is casting. And ask yourself, where is the light that is giving rise to that shadow? Well, if you had to guess, you probably would guess that it's above, because the shadow is straight down, and it's quite long, in fact. So something seems wrong. This is impossible, because, of course, he's being illuminated by the sun. In addition, people have argued that there is a problem with the shape of his face. Shown in the bottom left is a mugshot of Lee Harvey Oswald taken after he was arrested. And on the top is, again, the backyard photo. And you can see that on the bottom, his chin is quite narrow and tapered. But on the top, it's very broad, considerably different. Okay? So we have a little bit of a mystery. And for the last 50 years, people have pointed to this and other issues in this photograph as evidence of a broader conspiracy to kill Kennedy, because after all, law enforcement produced this photograph. And if they went to the trouble of creating a fake photograph to frame somebody, you got to believe that there's something going on behind the scenes. So I started the talk by saying, we're not actually that good at this. So how do we then reason about photographs like this with pretty serious implications? Well, to do so, I'm going to introduce some quantitative tools that we've developed in my lab here over the last 10 years that can help us reason quantitatively and critically and objectively about things like lighting and shadows. And then we'll come back to whether our intuition on this photograph is correct or not. So here's a very simple scene. We are outdoors, and there's a golf ball. And if I asked you to guess where the light was that was illuminating that ball, you would probably say, up and to the right. And why would you say that? You would say that because the top right part of the ball is bright, the bottom left part of the ball is dark, and there is a cast shadow being cast along the ground here, all evidence suggesting where the light is. Now, it turns out, because mathematics is so beautiful, we don't have to just guess. So if you make some simplifying assumptions, you can write an expression shown in the bottom left-hand corner that describes how much light strikes a surface as a function of four things. Here are the four things. R, which is the reflectance or the color of the object, how much light is absorbed, how much light is reflected. N, term the surface normal, is a vector or a line that points perpendicular to the surface. So for example, this is a nice little vector here. It's perpendicular to the surface. If I tilt the table, the vector goes with it. L, the direction to the light source, where is the dominant light, in this case the sun. And A, the ambient term, the amount of light that's just bouncing around and interreflected uniformly around everything. So we have a model that explains to us, for any point on the object, how much light strikes it. And here's the important intuition. This little expression, N dot L, term the inner product or dot product of two vectors, you're wishing you paid attention in algebra right now is proportional to the angle between the vectors. And what that means is when the surface points towards the light, you are the brightest. And as I turn and turn and turn, it gets darker and darker. Okay? So, and the reason, of course, that the bottom of the ball is not black is because we have this overall ambient term that is illuminating it. So, we now know how to quantify how much light strikes an object. And we know that it's proportional to the thing we care about. Where is the light? Because once we know where the light is, we know where the shadows are. That's simple geometry. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, here's the problem. I need to know something about the shape of the object. That n there is a vector that is perpendicular to a shape. But when I take a picture of that, I've lost that information. I have a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional world, and I've lost all information about 3D geometry. And now you're in trouble. Fortunately, the picture of Oswald is not arbitrary. It's of his face. And it turns out we're pretty good 
at generating 3D models of people's faces for the following reason. These are the mug shots of Oswald. It shows a profile view and a frontal view of him. And you can see, at least intuitively, that there's a fair amount of information here about the shape of his head. The side view tells you about how big his nose is, the shape of his chin, and the frontal view tells you about the spacing of the eyes, where the mouth is, where the nose is, the width and the height of the head. And it turns out, because heads are not completely arbitrary, they have a fairly consistent and reliable geometry, that you can take these two images and generate a 3D model of Oswald's head. So that's the 3D model we generated. And once we have that, we now have power. We now have those 3D surface normals, that red N, that I can put at any point on his face and it tells me what the perpendicular point is on that object. And when I have that, I can tell you where the light was in the scene. And this is incredibly cool because this photograph was taken in 1963 and I can tell you precisely where the light was relative to where Oswald was standing and I can start to reconstruct and reason about the shadows and the lighting. So, on the left is the original Oswald backyard photo and on the right is my less than stellar 3D rendering. It shows uh, an arbitrary articulated um, body a ground plane in gray. I have the post that's underneath the stairs and the back fence. And the reason why I'm not embarrassed to show this to you is because I don't care about you know, making this for DreamWorks. What I care about is where is that shadow, right? So the way this scene is being illuminated is with the light direction that was estimated from that 3D model I just built. And what you can see is, in fact, the shadow on the ground agrees very nicely with the shadow on the left. So we got the position of the light right. But now here's the question. What does it look like under his nose? So here's the model on the right. Here is Oswald on the left. And you can see all kinds of spectacularly fascinating things. So first of all, look under the nose. There is that long, straight shadow that is, in fact, consistent with the shadow that you saw on the ground plane, much to one's surprise. You also see that the shadows under the eyes, under the lip, even along the neckline, are perfectly consistent with the estimated position of the light. So what at first appeared to be something that was, didn't really make sense in terms of the shadows and the lighting position is in fact perfectly fine and physically possible with a very simple light, the sun illuminating him. You don't have to do anything complicated. The failure was your brain does not know how to reason about complex geometry having to do with lighting and shadows from a single image, but here's the problem. Your brain doesn't know it's bad at it. And so you think something's wrong when in fact everything is fine. Okay, so what about the chin? On the top is Oswald in the mugshot, and on the top right is our 3D model. Uh, focus on the chin, you see that our model captured very nicely that narrow chin. And on the bottom is what Oswald looked like in his backyard. And what you can see is that what appears to be a fat or broad chin is in fact only a shadow or a light, slight lighting gradient that is caused by the light in the scene. It's perfectly consistent. That is, that skinny little chin up there gives rise to that uh, broad chin in the bottom. And you can go through and, and go through all of the, 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 the purported evidence that people have argued is inconsistent in the photograph and show that, in fact, they're wrong and that the failures are not unreasonable, by the way. It's reasonable to have thought what they did. It's just that our brain is not very good at processing certain aspects of photographs. Now, what's fascinating about this example is that it has been at least partially responsible for fueling uh, decades-long conspiracy surrounding the assassination of a U.S. president. So if you didn't think this mattered, it's wrong. It matters, and it matters in a serious way. And this is not an isolated example. We daily and on a routine basis look at photographs in the media having to do with conflicts around the world, and we try to reason and understand about what's happening in the world. We routinely use photographs in a court of law, whether it's a local level, a state level, or a federal level, to put people in jail for a very long time. And we routinely use photographs and video and audio to justify wars in, around the world that have serious implications for the entire planet. So photographs are ubiquitous. 
We're comfortable with them, and yet there are some significant failures that we have in reasoning about them in a quantitative and analytic way, and they have implications. So I guess the theme of this conference is you may not have realized. So here it is. You may not have realized, but what you see in a photograph is not always what it appears to be. Thank you.